Good afternoon, a very warm welcome for our new episode of the From Home Export Day series, the online discussion of the Centre National de la Musique, Bureau Export, um, an organization that was launched in January 2020. And this series has been launched in the context of the crisis just a year ago. I am Françoise Claire, I'm head of classical and jazz music for the Centre National de la Musique. And I'm very delighted to welcome this amazing panel today for discussing the crucial topic of inclusion and diversity. How music organizations and artists are being able to deal with the subject considering the political willingness of our countries on different levels. How, can, what can we do? How can we do it? What is as urgent? How does it work with young musicians? How to change the old systems? To discuss the importance of this subject, we have gathered the most iconic and prestigious speakers and I'm sure this is going to be a fascinating conversation led by our, um, as usual, by our friend Eric Denut. Please feel free to share this panel with your colleagues and friends. Welcome to all our speakers and thank you very much for being with us. So now over to you, Eric. Thanks, Francois. Good afternoon, good morning for some of you and good evening, maybe for so some of you. So we are very, very honored of having that prestigious panel, as you said, on three continents for now, from North America, Europe, and Eurasia, I don't know how to name it. Um, so let's start maybe with introducing you, our panel members. I start with ladies, as uh, always. I start maybe with Yezim Gura. Yezim is the head of the Istanbul Foundation for the Arts and Culture. Good afternoon, Yezim. Good afternoon, Eric. Good afternoon, everybody. Barbara Hannigan. So I introduce Bar Barbara Hannigan, one of the most outstanding artists in our uh, uh, practice. So Barbara, I don't know exactly where you are now. You will tell us. Yes, I'm in London. Um, I arrived two days ago, so I'm in quarantine in London. Uh, and I have a concert with Simon uh, Rattle and the LSO at the... We start rehearsals on Friday when I'm out of quarantine. So, uh, but you know, as you know, I live in Paris, but uh, very, very happy to be with you all today. Oh, wonderful. So thank you so much for taking some time for being with, with, with us. My pleasure. Dear Barbara. Um, I go on maybe with Libby. Libby Abrams um, is the founders and co-CEO of Keynet Management, one of the most um, outstanding artists management. Uh, companies based in the UK. Is that right, Libby? Absolutely. Yes. Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Nice to be here. Thanks. Thanks so much for sharing your, your time with us today. I cross the Atlantic Ocean and go to Vanessa. Vanessa is the head of New Music USA and formerly uh, very famously head of the uh, foundation of the PRS in the UK. Good morning, Vanessa. Good morning. Thanks for having me. It's so great to be with you. It's great for us. Thanks so much. So I switch to um, the, um, the boys. Let's go to Anis. Anis Bonnet is, I think, quite close to Yevim in the neighboring country in Greece, the Anis. Indeed, I'm calling you from Athens today. Kalimera to all. Thank you. Thank you so much. I switch to the northern uh, uh, parallel and go to Germany, where George Lewis, famous composer, uh, North American composer, is joining us from Berlin. Wow. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, to every Hello to everyone. Really appreciate being here. Thanks. Thanks to you, dear George. And we uh, go back to circle to the French capital with Emmanuel André, head of the uh, artistic uh, department at the, um, I was saying, was going to say newly found, but not at all anymore, Philharmonie de Paris in, in Paris downtown. Very young institutions, in fact, yes. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Delighted to be with you. 
So thanks so much. We all know how busy are your time schedules, and we're also much proud to, of having you. So let's start maybe with the very first um, in, introduction. I will also start, uh, I start again with, with Yezim maybe. So Yezim, just um, tell us what was your first reaction as you were um, reading our, our email from Suaz and I, as we were telling you, we would love having your opinion on inclusion, diversity, gender equity in the classical music. Um, um, where were the first um, words and sentences which came up to your mind? Yeah, of course, I was, I was just thinking that uh, the world now we are living, uh, which is going through a cultural, political, social, economic change. I mean, it's always in constant change, but now due to pandemic, it's, uh, the, these problems are really getting uh, even worse. Uh, there are so many issues which remain to be solved, like climate change, uh, gender inequality, migration. Uh, so I was thinking about all these problems. And uh, uh, so when you propose, when you send me uh, this proposition, uh, I just switched to the classical music, this uh, all about all these problems. And unfortunately, uh, I just found out and I thought that classical music is probably one of the slowest sector uh, in making efforts to tackle these issues, like especially for what we are discussing now about uh, gender inequality, uh, inclusion and diversity. Of course, there are many positive developments over, over uh, some of the issues in the past 15, 20 years, but uh, Yes, uh, unfortunately, classical music uh, is very slow or it doesn't reflect the society now we are living in and still struggling in all these uh, conservative rules. So, yes, we have to discuss all these issues and uh, uh, this approach has to change. Uh, classical music has to change this very elitist point of view and has to stay relevant with all these issues that the world and communities are struggling to change now. This is what I, I thought when you proposed me uh, to, to just discuss all these issues together. So these were the first things in my mind coming to my mind. Dang, wow, such a roadmap we have. Um, Francoise, do we have any more minutes, maybe than 90 to solve all of this? Probably not. Um, so yes, th thank you. So I just summarized under your control. You, you said right. many, many, many things. So elitism, or at least there is something in the air which hints at it, um, not reflecting the society as it has become um, um, a slow, a slow sector. So we are going at Agio and not at Allegro, Manantropo, which we could also be going. But on the other side, you said many, many positive developments. So um, you you come back, of course, a little bit later on. But may I switch the word to Barbara Hanning? And Barbara has been one of these many positive developments. She has been not only doing the career we all know about, but also founding different um, 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 some kind of initiatives or so like um, momentum, which has been uh, uh, quite short term, I think, and due to the COVID situation, uh, a little bit older one was, I think, Equilibrium uh, Young Artists Mentoring. So please tell us, Barbara, um, why you came to the point in which you said, okay, I have to take some time for these initiatives and how the whole context, uh, all these uh, um, uh, challenges Yezim was naming, mm. including also the sustainability or migration, etc., cetera, um, um, how it came, it helped you to um, draft and design your initiatives. Mm -hmm. Well, um uh, probably some people don't know, but um, my career began as a singer. I'm still a singer, a classical singer for opera and so on. Uh, 
uh, but in uh, 2010, I started uh, on the path also as a conductor. So I, I do both. And um, it was very interesting because no one ever asked me how it felt to be a female soprano. But in uh, 2011, I started to get many questions about how it felt to be a female conductor. And it was, um, <clears throat> it was a strange question to answer. And at first, I, I was offended that I was asked this. And as time went on, I started to realize that it is of importance to many. And I think, and I'm actually absolutely fine with being asked the question because it allows me to return questions to the interviewer. Um, and what I, I, I found very moving in my first years and what I still enjoy as a conductor is, especially when I do concerts that have a lot of young people, um, it's wonderful to see young boys and young girls in the audience looking at an orchestra being led by a woman and not finding it strange not finding it rare because they haven't seen enough concerts to realize that this is a rarity. So um, I realize that there is an, an important role of leadership. And you asked about the initiatives that I formed. So in 2017, I created the Equilibrium Mentoring Initiative. Um, and I simply created it because I could. I had reached a point of, let's say, having enough power, having enough uh, networks and uh, support in my career that I was able um, to create an initiative that was mentoring younger professional artists in the first substantial phase of their career um, <clears throat> and to work in a particular way that I feel leads towards not only a successful career but a satisfying career which has to do not only with the singing but with the total health of the system, of the mental discipline, um, physical health, um, focus, preparation, high, high level of musicianship, curiosity, risk taking, etc. And I have had to this point uh, over 700 or 800 auditions now. Um, we're into our third season. I have artists from 15 countries, from Cuba, Guadeloupe, uh, Greece, um, uh, Canada, America, Germany, Sweden, uh, you know, all over the place. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy with that initiative. And um, it, it, as a result of the pandemic, I was having a lot of Zoom sessions with young artists. And not only the young artists of Equilibrium, but also, as many of us had just so much time in one place, we said yes to all the master classes we were asked to do and all the Zoom sessions and so on. So I was talking to young artists all over the world, in Australia and in reaching people in Asia and in North America and, of course, in Europe. And what the young artists were telling me was that um, it's all well and good to find things to do while they are not able to perform, but what they really, really need is to perform. What they really, really need is to be on stage to continue their momentum. And so I thought, well, I should listen to them. And uh, I got on the phone in August for about two or three weeks straight. Um, and I called everybody that I knew or wanted to know, um, from Renaud Capuçon to Natalie Dessay to Simon Rattle to Sir Mark Elder to Brinterfell and Roddy Williams and artists all over the world. And I asked them um, to share the stage with young professionals now, because there were so few concerts happening, and the people that were asked to do the concerts were leading artists. And so I asked my leading artist colleagues to create space, basically to give a seat at the table to uh, a younger professional colleague, someone that they may already know and want to support. Um, if it's a 70-minute program, give them 10, 15 minutes of the program. And with conductors, I asked my conductor colleagues um, to invite always, or whenever possible, an assistant conductor, and not only to let them sit in the hall and listen to the rehearsal, but to give them 20 minutes of podium, podium time during the rehearsal period with the orchestra, 
which is something that doesn't often happen in, let's say, in the real, real life. The assistant conductor does not get on the podium. But I insisted that this is the only way that conductors learn, is by being in front of the orchestra. It's the most um, productive way for them to learn. And can you imagine when Daniel Harding or Simon Rattle or François-Xavier Roth takes an assistant, puts them on the podium, has the supporting generosity of the orchestra, gives them 20 minutes, um, and then is, of course, it results naturally and also in a mentoring situation as the week goes on. So, of course, everyone that I asked said yes. I had won an award. I was able to fund the initiative uh, through the, the financial or expected financial income from that award. And I asked presenting organizations and the leading artists themselves to also financially contribute to the initiative so that it's a, it's, everyone is contributing to help our younger colleagues. Um, and I mean, even last week, uh, I was in Switzerland. I had a concert last Friday in Winterthur, and I had a young um, conductor, Luis Castillo Briseño, from Costa Rica, who lives in Switzerland, who is my assistant. Uh, we put him on the podium. They filmed it. He had a, has a now a video for his private use, the support of the orchestra, and most importantly, a new relationship, um, which helps him continue to learn as we are all continuing to learn um, on his path towards towards the development of, of his career. So I took a lot of time, but thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, that's what I've been up to. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks. It sounds really great. May I add this first question? What was the impact of having these young people on the repertoire's choice? Did you notice they were also bringing with them kind of diversity in the choice of repertoire, or was it more or less business as usual? Well, I think the pandemic has allowed us to change a lot of repertoire, which has been super fun, because as you know, my interest is really in um, lesser known music or contemporary music and or contemporary music. So I think um, among musicians, all of us are quite excited because the pandemic has forced us to change programs at the last minute. It's allowed us to um, replace larger, let's say, warhorse pieces with um, smaller constructions. And we can't program the Barber Adagio for strings on every single concert. So we're, we're really finding some very interesting um, repertoire. Um, the, as far as the assistant conductors go, they have to, do, they have to learn the music that we've programmed. Um, and as far as the younger artists that are programming other pieces, I think it's a collaboration between the leading artist and the younger artist. Um, certainly, we have a diverse uh, group of younger artists that have been involved, um, both in, in conductors and in performers. Um, and I can't say that I'm totally up to speed on all the repertoire that's been programmed. Because um, I'm in the middle of my own, my own learning process for the things that I'm performing, but I, I think we've had some very, some very interesting um, choices. So, yeah. right. Thanks. Thanks. So, apropos leadership, we come to, uh, to we, we 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 stay in London and we we go to um, Libby Abrams' office. Um, so, Libby knows something about leadership. I mean, she is representing one of the key conductor in practice field occurrences and one of the key pianists, Hélène Grimaud. So as also as an artist, but also as a, as a woman, I would be very, very interested to hear about uh, Lippi's view on how our industry has developed regarding um, the role, the opinion, the mindset of our industry towards um, female artists like Hélène Grimaud in, a, in, a, in an instrument which is not presumably like a soprano or a mezzo, uh, far de facto feminine. Um, so did you notice certain things that you want to share with us? And as an entrepreneur also, uh, how is the world going relative to these uh, topics we are discussing today, Libby? I mean, when you first called me to ask me to do this, you know that I basically went into a blind panic. Um, I think it's, um, it's always very difficult as a commercial agent to somehow answer some of these questions because we have a, we have a different um, 
a different viewpoint. Um, we also have a responsibility, but we have a different viewpoint. And I think the topics that we are covering now are so huge that um, that sort of also fed into my blind panic. But talking specifically about Helen and how the business has changed, I mean, I know the world, I know the classical music world is slow, but I think when it comes to gender inequality, it's still a, it, it's still a massive point in society as a whole. And so um, it's, you know, it's very easy to specify in the classical music world, but I think we can all, all the women here, and hopefully all the men around this, in this discussion can still easily see that there is still a massive gender inequality in society as a whole. Um, and that is still very prevalent in the business as well, um, working with Elaine. Of course, she's um, well known these days and, um, and that has a value. And I suppose she doesn't come up against the same issues as she did as a younger artist, for example, um, you know, uh, conductors advances, uh, not responding to them, the impact on reinventations, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of issues like that, which I think are more prevalent when you're a younger artist than a, an older, more successful artist. Um, and it does close doors if you're not open to um, certain advances. I think also with someone like Helen, where it does work against female artists is if that they have a, a list of criteria so they want to have a longer working rehearsal or request two working rehearsals. That's, that's uh, a diva. Whereas when a man asks for those same kinds of conditions, that's a very learned artist that needs to be respected. And I think, you know, I, I hope I'm not, uh, you know, going to very trivial points, but in a way I think that they, they still, um, I think they highlight still the inequality and we still face it. And I have had situations where Alain and Ted will have worked together and it, seeing the difference in the way that both of them were treated in the same places is quite, was, was kind of slaps you in the face. One's a conductor, one's an instrumentalist, of course, there's slightly different requirements, but, but it's still a totally different way in which, um, men and women are treated, I think, even nowadays. Um, and as an entrepreneur, look, it's, it's not so difficult to start um, a business um, and to um, find a way of doing it. I was very lucky to work with uh, Charles Adrianson from out here, who I'd known for a long time, and he was very helpful in supporting me. Um, he's a very silent partner, which is also lovely. Um, but all of the uh, mail that I receive from banks and uh, other companies is always addressed to Charles, never addressed to me, even though I'm the only one doing the, the, the business side of it. It's my business. He's just very happy to support it as much as possible. So, you know, there is still there is still, still very much a man's world in many ways, um, even in uh, even in our business. Okay, so um, we, we come probably um, back to some of the issues you have noticed with um, other. I have many are. more. <laughs> uh, good, good, good. But thanks so much for. But may we ask uh, how is Ellen doing in these last months and your artists in general? You know, it differs from artist to artist and where they are in their in their lives. I mean, Helen hasn't played a concert really for. Um, for a year the last time I saw her face to face was a year ago that's hard that's hard for our relationships um, and it's the same with all of our artists it has it does have an impact when you can't be with them and uh, share things with them but but you know conductors I think have fared better generally because there's been a lot more opportunities for them to work with orchestras a lot more opportunities for streaming um, you know, and some of the younger artists, and we've really tried to encourage them, especially this time last year, we've really helped build their projects and, um, you know, try and to get things going that perhaps in the ordinary days, normal days or the olden days, whichever way you look at it, we wouldn't have had a chance to do that because everyone would have been running around um, in their own, in their own place. And what what the pandemic has allowed us to do is to spend time and to develop projects and to look outside of the usual way of doing things, which I hope will stay. 
even when the world gets back to something normal. Right. Well, we adhere to your optimism. So let's hope future <laughs> yeah. return. You you were you were right. We we is there such an optimism also in the United States, Vanessa? So may I introduced you as the head of New Music USA. You you have to tell us what is exactly New Music U USA, but all the more you have also to tell us about all the initiatives like key change initiative you have taken in your career and how these um, topics, these items um, we, are, we were discussing now were um, leading in different choices uh, you have taken in your, in your career path. Sure, thank you, Eric. Um, so yeah, at the moment I'm president and CEO of New Music USA, which is based in New York, but we're a national resource for the whole new music community supporting composers and organizations who are commissioning new work and we're working across all genres really to support an equitable ecosystem for new music so i've always been passionate about seeing equity and inclusion in the arts and i'm just tempted to quickly respond to some of the things i've heard before i uh, tell my story but i i really love your contributions so far and I think one thing I want to say, though, is that, yes, of course, we're seeing inequities across every walk of life. But I think the thing that the thing that drives me is that I really, truly believe that the arts and culture should be leading the way, not following what's happening across society. I think in the arts, whether it's music or any other art form, we should be challenging the status quo. We should be exposing um, inequities and we should be bringing to light new ways of thinking, new ways of doing, and applying all that amazing creativity that the people we work with has um, to a, a better world. And I, I agree with the point that's been made that now is the time to do that. Um, I know that you know one of the moments that stays in my mind through all these many Zoom conversations we've had is, is you know, being part of a women in music conference where Marin Olsop was present. And with Marion, you just get this sense that, you know, we've been having this discussion for so long now, particularly about women in music, but now more about racial equity in music in the United States too. And I think one of the disappointing things, but also a, a, a kind of optimistic moment to hold on to is that it's taken Me Too, Black Lives Matter and two pandemics, kind of COVID, excuse me, and lots of um, uprisings and a, and a racial reckoning to finally um, sort of implore the art sector to have all the conversations it's having. So for me, it's been, you know, it's way overdue that, that we're actually really now trying to get down to what can we do to make a different world. And, and I suppose I'm saying that based on the fact that when I was at PRS Foundation, it was back in 2011 that we started the first ever fund, which was targeted specifically at female composers and songwriters. And back then there was very little debate or discussion about the, the low representation of women, even though we were pointing that out that only 13% of the collecting society's membership was female, only 16% of the applications we were receiving featured female composers in the commission proposals. So I think, you know, things are definitely moving in the right direction, but I really feel that now is the time for people to kind of say, okay, enough's enough. And I think the other point I really want to make clear is that I believe absolutely that, you know, it's moral and just for all kinds of people of all backgrounds to be represented in music and the arts. But as a music lover, I also really believe that the music program will be much stronger if we are, you know, finding the talent we work from from a di more diverse talent pool. So it's not just about doing the right thing. It's also about strength, strengthening our industry and strengthening the quality of the music because we've just got into lazy habits of doing things in a certain way. And this applies, in my view, to every genre of music from pop um, through to jazz and classical. We're seeing repeated ways of doing things, 
a huge domination of white men on live performance stages in the recording studio in, in the recording studio in every part of the music industry. And so, you know, we have an opportunity now to really stand back and realize that there are multiple benefits to making a change. And, and just to kind of touch briefly on the key change movement, um, what was so fascinating about that is that it built on our Women Make Music Fund from 2011, um, but it was really about the timing that, that made that program such a, a global um, phenomenon. And it's because of Me Too. So in a way we had to rely on grassroots movements from across other sectors to give us the platform from which we could then sort of point out to the music industry that we were also part of the problem. So that's when um, we were demonstrating how few uh, festival lineups were featuring female acts. We were also, as, as Barbara has been, very deeply committed to investing in the next generation of artists. So Key Change was a kind of twofold program and it's still going. There are now over 450 festivals that have signed a pledge to gender equity by 2022. And, and that's opened up to include all kinds of music organizations, including orchestras and classical promoters. So I'm, I'm really optimistic about that. I think it's gonna need more than five years to achieve that 50-50 balance and it will keep going. Um, but, I, but I think, these kinds of initiatives are crucial. The success of those initiatives is when they're not needed anymore. And when we all work together and use this moment of disruption to create a new normal, where composers of all backgrounds are just as likely to be on stage as any other. And I just wanna end with a, a brief quote, and it was, it was something that Barbara said that inspired, that reminded me of this quote. Um, I was preparing a, a kind of monologue for. BBC Radio 3, and I found this quote from a pianist and professor from Temple University. She was connected with Philadelphia Orchestra, who we've been working with on our Amplifying Voices program. And when it comes to racial equity, for example, she was saying, black composers need no defense, no explanation, no patronizing, they need performance. And that goes back to what Barbara was saying, is that all of these people who've been marginalized, I think we should assume that they are absolutely as talented as, as the people who have been on stage, but they just haven't been given that opportunity. We know that talent is everywhere, but opportunity isn't. So I think that's what we need to be working towards with all the various you know, initiatives that I know many people here are involved with. Thanks, thanks so much. Maybe, um... I, um, there were many, many, many fantastic um, ideas in, uh, in uh, your words and Libby's and Barbara's and Yazim's one. Let's um, maybe go on with uh, that main claim, enough with lazy habits, which uh, I, I appreciate very much. Shall, shall we go to, to, to Greece? Um, I don't know if there were any habits in uh, in uh, involving um, young people which had no contact with the classical music or practice so far in, uh, in, in the symphonic activity. Uh, Annie, so tell us more about um, El Sistema in, in Greece and, and um, everything which has been moved through El Sistema in Greece, which is not only um, from artistic uh, 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 um, uh, range, but also social and even probably political. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to be here because everything that you have said so far resonates a lot in me. Um, my own journey reflects exactly this topic of the day on diversity. I have myself a multicultural background, my father being a Tunisian from Muslim origin, and my mother being a Danish from Protestant descent. Um, I was born and raised in France. I have the chance to work in France, but also in the US, in the UK, and now in Greece, where I called you from. Um, I co-founded a few years ago El Sistema Greece, which is a social inclusion through music project, using music as a tool for social inclusion. Basically, what we do is we provide a free music education for refugees, for migrants and Greek children, 
since 2016 based on the philosophy of El Sistema in Venezuela and of course adapted to the reality of the ground in Greece. Considering what Yeshim was saying, all these interconnected ground challenges that we have, the economic, um, social, refugee and now health crisis um, that the country is facing. What we advocate for is a safe space for intercultural dialogue and openness. We want the students to understand that they have a common goal, let's say a concept, and they have to achieve this goal by working as a team, developing values such as solidarity, tolerance, but also discipline. And music is really the universal language, as we have more than 30 different nationalities, diverse languages, and religions. So you can imagine the, the joyous mix of the classroom. We consider all the children as artists and we give them the tools for developing their own active citizenship, but also their agency. We value a lot and celebrate the diversity um, of the students by selecting diverse repertoire, not only the Western classical music, but also traditional Greek music. They are here in Greece and they need to understand where they are. Um, also, we do an El Sistema Greece school of hip hop integrating the four elements of the hip hop. And last but not least, we also integrate the countries of origins music, asking each of the kids to explain the meaning of a song, um, the pronunciation of the lyrics, and also speaking about their own history. And we believe in this empowerment um, by giving a space to speak out because most of the kids that we have they have a traumatic experience while arriving in Greece. And the message is very clear. By knowing each other better, we don't consider the other as a threat, but really as part of us. And brings to the theory of change to shift the mentalities. This is the big picture on especially the refugee question from a threat to really an added value on the society. Um, El Sistema Greece became reality because I'm also the tour manager of the orchestras and choirs of El Sistema Venezuela. Before the pandemic, I used to tour with wonderful ensembles, organizing all of this from Asconas Holt, one of the leading agencies um, in classical music in the world. And for the last six years, I have accompanied the young Venezuelan talent all over the world. And I really saw firsthand the combination between this artistic excellence. We had a few concerts uh, at the Philharmonie de Paris with Emmanuel, also with Yeshim in Istanbul. Um, this artistic excellence, but also the social component, which is very important. We went to schools, we did side-by-side -side concerts with local communities, uh, we visited hospitals, went to prisons, and I have been amazed since day one about this special DNA, how the music was a connector and a healer between any community and the artists that we have on stage. Um, and before this international journey, I had the chance to start a community project at the Maîtrise de Radio France, the children's choir of the National Public Radio, with a development in Bondy, a suburb in Paris, where in 2007, an educational and social experiment started in partnership with policymakers, the City Hall, of course, but also the region, the Ministry of Education, Association, and Radio France. It was one of these positive discrimination projects that the city of Bondy was part of, um, alongside the Sciences Po Paris admissions or the Bondy blog with the Ecole Supérieure de Journalisme de Lille. And through the arts and music, in particular for the Maîtrise de Radio France, it was a way of promoting this social inclusion. Now, while working for the strategic development of El Sistema Greece, multiplying partnerships and being a reference in the field of music education with refugees, I also manage the Community Arts Network, a joint venture between Porticus and the Hilti Foundation, which assembles more than 2,000 people and organizations interested in the arts for change movement. I work with artists, art institutions, grassroots organizations, businesses, foundations and philanthropic circles, um, uh, policy makers, youth and activists, platforms and power tables in six areas globally. 
these six areas are really these interconnected grand challenges that Yeshim was talking about. Um, and we try to develop these partnerships for impact with a focus on art for education, art for climate, art for business, art for um, democracy, art for hope, and art for well being. I'm a firm believer of the transformative power of the arts, witnessing every day how this unfolds in front of my eyes. And being a product of this myself, as I started my path by learning the clarinet and the piano in my hometown music school in France. I'm, I'm very lucky to have received a great education. And what I try to do now is to reinvest this chance in the other kids' lives. Um, so basically, it's a, it's a, it's a new territory in, in Greece because it has so much history and, and, and diversity, but at the same time, it's a new phase of Europe with all the, the, the new reality that is there today. And I think that music can really connect hearts and minds, but it's not the only solution to the problem. And I agree that classical music is only one of the tools, but every multidisciplinary form of art should be and, and could be used for that. I'm, I'm overwhelmed honest, with your <laughs> presentation. I mean, we thought till now that the um, four former uh, participants were already more than busy in their daily life. I mean, they, what you were doing, but this time, honest, um, um, I can't imagine how you find enough um, time and energy to, to, to do all, all of this with 30 nationalities. Did I understand rightly? four or five different or many more probably music genres and music styles to be and and acting in the in in hospitals and very different um contexts than the concert hall um and and you maybe we we should come back to the community arts network um later on because it's it's uh, if i understood it rightly it's an international um uh, uh based organization which may may make sense for 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 many of us and not just in in the greek um and and environment so may, may, many thanks many thanks again um we um vanessa were mentioning the fact and we are in some way impoverished by the the uh, the lack of, of diversity in the uh in the sourcing of our um, talents and probably also in the sourcing of our audiences um george this is something you have been conceptualizing um, with a lot of hope, I take back that word from Annie's uh, mouth, uh, in the last decades, um, I don't need to name the figures, but we know there is only a very, very, very tiny minority of Black musicians in the European, Asian, North American orchestras and South American orchestras. Um, and there is a very, very tiny majority um, um, minority of, of um, uh, Black composers have been being performed um, by many, many ensembles, and not only symphonic orchestras, also new music ensembles. And you have been a driving force in Frankfurt with Ensemble Modern, in London with Sifonietta, in New York City with the Ice, in Berlin with Mert Music, trying to find a way to neutralize that impoverishment. Can you tell us a bit more about who you are as an artist, what you stand for as a, as a, uh, um, um, also as an artist and as a human being, and which perspectives, even short term, you see at um, um, uh, neutralizing this, this shameful facts I was just describing? You know, first of all, I just wanted to say that all of the perspectives I've heard so far are incredibly important, but also it can be seem a bit daunting, like you, you know, the octopus, you're fighting the octopus, and the octopus or the hydra, perhaps, and it keeps drawing new heads, keep growing new heads and cut off one and two more, and three more and take its place. Now, lately, you know, I, my, I've tended to narrow my focus a little bit over the last 20, 30 years <laughs> to, um, to two areas, I think, uh, composing uh, and uh, scholarly writing, academic writing. And so, which I've been doing since about 95, 96. And, 
And increasingly, that leads you to the, the confluence of those two areas leads you to a third metier, which you can, which is curating. Now, I wouldn't say I'm a full-time curator by any means, but um, I find that in recently in working with organizations like Merit's Musique or also the Darmstadt Ferry and Cursa in 2018, where we started to rethink the, the curation of contemporary music or the other things you mentioned, Merit's Musique and so on, I started to find that it was a bit like the old Beatles song. Um, you know, the old Beatles song, fixing a hole where the rain gets in. And the field, at least I'm talking about classical contemporary music has a lot of holes. And I didn't feel that I could fix them all. But I, so I decided to concentrate on one in particular that was a really big hole that it lasted a long time and was very obviously in need of repair. And that was the business of the absence, the myth of absence. I think here they're calling it the mythos der Wesenheit of the Afro diasporic composer on classical music stages and not only stages, but also histories uh, written about the field. And also um, just in general, you find this, maybe there isn't anybody, that's why we're not seeing anybody. And of course that's not the case. I've, you know, I've, I've seen plenty of people over the years. And I started to wonder, particularly in Europe, why these people were not present in, on, the, on, the, on the programs and in the histories and so on. I'm particularly concerned about history as a scholar. And if we don't see them written about, they disappear from the consciousness. And if we don't, it's not just the stages, it's often people who don't appear that much, who, who actually don't receive that many performances. You can still read about them in books, but it's not the case with these people for some reason. It was sort of a glaring hole. And we compared that with one of the other glaring holes, which is the absence of women. We started to see, at least I started to see that statistically speaking, the absence of Afro-diasporic composers, which is actually a huge part of the world, was even more glaring, you know, the, the very, very small numbers, which didn't add up in terms of, there was, a, there was a disconnect between the quality I was seeing in the field and the lack of attention being paid by the field. And what I felt was that this was impoverishing the field. I've heard that phrase used already, already once. And uh, so as a person who is vitally invested in the field, I feel that this work is a, is a way of defending it and a way of keeping quality alive to develop a kind of a new complexity. I mean, not, not so much a diversity anymore. And I, you know, I, I published this piece last week called uh, New Music Decolonization and Eight Difficult Steps. And, and one of the things was, it looked a little curmudgeonly to some people and saying, well, diversity discourse, great, but it ends up being like, you know, I got my knee replaced last year and it's still awfully clunky. So it looked like a clunky knee replacement, very prosthetic. Well, what we really needed was a change of identity and consciousness. So the idea that um, somehow everything has to begin and end with um, a certain group of people who are all constantly being recirculated, constantly being presented, and other people, the field itself becomes discouraged. So what I found, for example, was that people thought, well, you know, um, Okay, we're ready for you now. Women, people of color, come on in, y'all come. And the problem is they've been waiting so long they gave up. So there's nobody at the door. It's not like they're not there, but they figure, well, you're not thinking about this. So we're just gonna move ahead and find out because part of the job of any artist is to find people who like you. And you know, the hell with everybody else, frankly. So, so the idea is to keep, and so we have to bring those people back. And as an academic teaching at Columbia University, and as an academic with, I mean, 30 some years of experience in various institutions, I found that the numbers of women and people of color who apply for jobs or who apply for graduate programs or whatever is still about the same as it was in 1991 when I got my first job. And so why is that? That means that one of the major pipelines toward producing these composers is not producing anybody. So a lot, of, and so you can't just say y'all come. A lot of the groundwork has to be accomplished in terms of the educational systems. And I think it, including El Sistema and communitarian um, networks. And of course, but also I find in my own field at the university level, um, I find myself 
looking out, someone used the term positive discrimination. Well, if you don't do it, nothing happens. So because of the numbers being so low. So in the end, I'm thinking that if all those universities around the country, all those music programs around the world started thinking about some of these things, 10 years from now, we'd be in a whole different situation. But right now, it's very difficult because of myths of meritocracy, for example, being one, and of several of the other difficult steps that I outline in this article. So what we're doing to cap this off, um, I've been, we've been presenting, the work with Ensemble Modern was very important because, and the work with the London Sinfonietta was also very important because up until that time, you know, I was, you know, because I sort of speak German, okay, I, I've been on these German shows talking and stuff. And, and you know, the, the question they asked is, we didn't know this work existed. In other words, it just wasn't there. It wasn't on the consciousness. It wasn't on the radar. So this has been a very important work by Azal Modern just to, and, and the Sinfonietta, to just bring this consciousness to work, to bring the diversity in the music itself to life. So there's no way of predicting on the basis of someone being an Afro-diasporic composer what the music is going to sound like. Those kinds of stereotypes are meaningless. So what we're looking at is something that we don't know what's going to happen with it because we just haven't heard it before. And so that was the hole I decided to fix, the hole in the roof, because it was getting very glaring. And what we found is, and that's why I'm hopeful, uh, we're finding a lot of positive response to this obviously great music by people like Hannah Kendall or Jesse Cox or the older generation, Alvin Singleton, uh, uh, Tanya Leon, and, and many more. So I think is, but the main thing, just to finish up this, because I know I've been talking for a while already, um, if we don't change the identity matrix of the music, that is so that it, it is not primarily seen as a music of the white European diaspora that becomes sort of moves around the planet and conquers everybody, but as something much more open to local identities, to local realities, to present music that comes from individual groups, but can still be regarded as a bunch of new histories for classical music. And when those new histories come to the fore and when the people who are involved with them come to the fore, what you get is the possibility that classical music becomes a real world music. So that's what I've been doing. Fascinating. I've, I've, I've had been in the lucky situation, thanks to you, dear George, to read the uh, new music decolonization in eight different steps, a little bit before some other people. I was just wondering, did you get already some reactions after having published the paper? Well, the nicest reaction I got was that two people got in touch with me and said, we want to translate this into French. But that, 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 <laughs> that's good. That was good, great. Good, good, good you say that. because We, we moved to Emmanuel André, who I, I, I uh, and again, is the head of the artistic department at Philharmonie de Paris. And we were talking about um, uh, stopping um, um, the lazy habits and laziness. You were talking about difficulties, and Barbara was talking some minutes ago about leadership. This is probably the triangle which has been defining the Philharmonie de Paris from the very beginning and the Cité de la Musique two decades before. It's its capacity of tackling difficulties, of neutralizing laziness, in the uh, uh, in my home country and Emmanuel's one and Anis one um, uh, and and also of course to um, to be uh, uh, to have some kind of leadership to challenge things through leadership. So Emmanuel, we had um, in St. Claire Gibo in one of our webinars uh, uh, some months ago. We've been talking now with Anis about El Sistema, and we know there is this French. Uh, um, I don't know how to put it, it's a kind of spin-off of El Sistema with some differences, of course, called de Demos, with huge differences. I, I want to, to go into that deeper. So please, now, you um, after that first circle of discussions, um, it comes to you the um, capacity maybe to, not to conclude, but to, to give us uh, an insight of how big a house with now more than tens of, of, of of, of, of millions of budget is uh, helping the world to be a little bit better on, 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 on these issues. Thank you, Eric. Um, Demos is a, is a part of the uh, initiatives we, we try to launch and to support 
um, because we think it's global. Um, as said uh, Yesim, we have the, the companies, we have economic fields, we have politicians, we, uh, and also the, the same for us because we have departments, the orchestra, the, the artistic department, but also resources, pedagogy and the uh, museum. It's a connection. And then if we move together, we can win, we can change. If we, we are alone, we, we, you are just um, proud of doing by yourself something, but um, it's too many efforts for uh, a few results. So in the Philharmonie, we try to work together and it's not easy uh, to, to act in the same way. Demos, you're right, is um, like the Sistema, uh, a social inclusion project, 10 years of uh, experience. So it's a French Sistema in a way. Um, the, we just limit the, to the children from seven to 12 uh, years old. And um, at the end of the process, they can um, integrate the conservatory. A third of them uh, go in the conservatories because we think it's really important not to create a bubble, uh, but to connect also these culture. I, I'm proud to say it's a, also a matter of culture. Uh, as you said, Anis, how you consider uh, learning, being together, uh, acting, uh, thinking, uh, dancing, uh, uh, considering the other. It's a culture. It's also a culture for the teachers because uh, it's a new method like in, a, in the Sistema, a bit different, but people in a traditional way don't know how to teach when you don't read um, because they have been taught before like this. So it's a face-to-face, -face. you have to forget and then to build another way of teaching music. So it goes very deep in the identity of each musician, each member of the administration team uh, to keep the, the spirit of an experience. That's for me something very important, not to replace um, a scheme by another one, a system by another one, sorry, and easy. We try to, to be out of a system or to keep the experience as a system. Um, and for that, we also, need people to analyze, to give reports, to, as a neuroscientist or a teachers, just to be out of the system, out of the experience and tell us, are we right to do it? We, we had doubts about this. Can you inform, give us more um, distance uh, when we act? Um, 60 orchestras, more than uh, 6,000 uh, young children. And um, now we are proud of it um, because it's uh, right, a, a social inclusion um, project. And you can see it uh, when you go to a demos concert, of course. The message for the society is great because then for the first time you have a diverse orchestra in France. We have none for the professional, even none for the amateur orchestra. So in a way, it's a, it's a bet. We, we try to create a new generation of new musicians and also to break cliche. Um, classical music is supposed to be socially and historically speaking, uh, the matter of white people and educated people and the uh, underprivileged, um, sometimes uh, black or diverse, they, they only have pop because they are supposed not to uh, like other music than pop music or hip hop, rap or whatever. It's a, it's a huge and heavy cliche. So Demos in a way is very simple, is to offer classical music to those who are supposed not to like this music. And what happened? Of course they like it. And the reverse experience is nice because then we also change classical music classical attitude, which is, we hope, not classical anymore. What is classical? Academism, tradition, you know, these kind of dead people, dead composers, classical. So we try to put life in classic. And it's not easy to understand this for the, 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 the general people, but that's very, very important and, and um, symbolically speaking, very important. The other initiative is La Maestra. La Maestra is a competition. And we know the problem when you uh, launch a competition, you compete. 
and uh, to compete is bad. <laughs> of course, we need competition to, to see what or, or what could be the most interesting uh, musical personalities, but you exclude. So we try to keep the competition, but to balance it with a, an academy uh, and to create a group with the, the, the winners, the, those who, who, who are supposed to be the best, but to work together later during two, uh, two years, not only to give concerts, because for me it doesn't mean anything to give concerts, but to know each of the winners, each of the musicians, and to work with them. And thank you, Barbara, for welcoming uh, and hosting one of the mice in, uh, in, in two. Oh, thank you. Because we share exactly, I hope, the same spirit, because we want to help, we want to mentor, but to learn from them too. Because day after day, we, we learn. And the best is to change ourselves in this kind of uh, project. We have no time. It's. Um, it's not, a, of course, it's a positive action because we, it's only for female conductors, only for women. We have been very much attacked in France because it's not our tradition to do like this, more some other countries, but we assume that um, because it was also an emergency action. We need, we need to act not in three or five years. It's now to have the first results in five or in 10 years. So we have no time, like uh, exactly with an environment. We need to do it very quickly. With people who want, who dream of uh, changing things, but also not to exclude those who just want to wait and see, because we need them to. At the end, it's global. We don't want to attack uh, uh, with one community, uh, another one. We need to, to be together conscious of um, willing um, more harmony, I would say. Um, I don't feel feminist. <laughs> I feel um, um, supporter of uh, equality. And at the end, my uh, understanding is to forget stereotype, forget fight in a way, but to support something open, uh, respectful. And in fact, that's very simple, but difficult to, to do it. And, and I also very, very, very careful when I try to support one of um, an important new artist. If you um, discriminate in a positive way, you can also kill these people mm. because um, you, are, you de designate these people as a, the result of your positive action but in fact, you use them. So mm -hmm. I'm very, very careful. So at the end, I would say I act, but I never mention it, except if it's global, but never, never personal, uh, global, collective. And then as I did for the, the concerts, I'm, I fight um, against the season, the establishment of classical music, you know, and I, try to promote the festival spirit. I, I like the festival because a festival is flexible. You can create whenever you like your, the length. Of, okay, you, you're flexible. So I found the academy as something new for me. Uh, it's already known concept, but is it a concept? What is an academy? Uh, uh, do some people know? I don't know, but there's an academy La Maestra I try to build a new one for the, um, uh, the composers, just because um, it's not only about quotas. It's not because you have found uh, equally men and women composers that you have done a good job. Um, you have to go deeper in the, the analysis of the situation and know where are the borders, the, the difficulties and the issues. So then we have to work with the conservatories, with the level of um, music education, but also not to forget that we have a responsibility. In France, we are among the, the countries we have done 
so much for contemporary music, classical con contemporary music, and there's not in, each year uh, a single woman composer from that field emerging from France, from the French conservatories. There are some, if you carefully look at them, but very, very, very few. So it's, it's very um, disturbing, I would say. Um, and the last one is the Academy for Orchestra. It's a, another dream, but I think orchestra is, is a society. Uh, that's the, the portrait of a society. So if, you, if we need to change the classical um, field, we need to change the orchestra and to go deeper in the subject and to learn how to be a new member of an orchestra of tomorrow. So the point is the orchestra academies. How can we create some new initiatives? Well, look in France, we have none. Orchestra academies compared to Germany, uh, which has plenty of orchestra academies. So for the first time, it's an advantage to be the last one. Uh, then we have a white page. Okay, let's work on it. And can we define, uh, can we make a portrait of the, the orchestra member of tomorrow, the ideal new generation of people uh, working with the, the new generation, the teachers, the conservatories, the, the, the schools, the orchestra, the venues, all together, can we dream together? Um, so that's the third um, project we, we try to, to investigate now. We, we love breaking news with Francois. Was it kind of breaking news, Emmanuel? We already had some in our web seminars. Are you telling us Philharmonie de Paris will take a very decisive affirmative action um, in the orchestra field? With his new orchestra academy, probably with Orchestre de Paris, I suppose. Yes, so. why not? We we don't want to predict or to act or to direct. Um, we just want to help. Uh, we are in a very paradoxical situation because Philharmonie is strong, like many institutions. But if you are not humble, you are mm, there's a, a big out of the issue. box. Yeah. Exactly. So if you can hack being humble, then I think you can have a good process, uh, a global one. Okay, Barbara, I wanted to react about La Maestra, I think. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, um, La Maestra was a very interesting um, experience for me because I'm not sure if I was asked to be a part of it. I think I might have been. And I, or, and, and I think my feeling was uh, at the time that I wasn't comfortable with an all-female conducting competition, but I did watch it. And then when I watched it, I, I realized, I still am not sure how I feel about it, but I realized how necessary it was. And because um, we would not have seen those young women uh, conducting if that competition had not existed. And, um, for example, uh, Glass Marcano, um, such an extraordinary uh, bundle of energy. And I was just speaking about her just before this call with the conductor that I'll work with later this week. Um, and we'll send him some videos of her. Um, and I thought, OK, I was on the jury for the Mahler competition the last two times that it happened in Bamberg. I, Glass Marcano would not be accepted yet to that competition because she's not, she wouldn't be ready yet for that level. On the other hand, all of us that watched her in the Maestro competition were extremely excited and continue to be excited by her talent. And she's kind of been adopted in France, I think, by, by many different conductors and musicians who are really excited and watching her development. So I realized that by making that positive action of the competition, we saw people we otherwise would not have seen, and you reached people that otherwise would not have been reached. So it, it was a fantastic effort and, and a successful effort. And, but I was thinking over the course of, of all these conversations also by, um, well, things that, points that everyone has said, um, for me, the, let's say the music world that we live in 
is based on trust and relationships. So we often, once we know someone, once we develop trust or relationship with that person, we want to continue to work with that person. That said, um, when we want to change the, the identity ma- matrix, I think that's what you said, George, how are we going to find the people with whom we want to build trust and relationships? How do we reach the, the not the, let's say, the, the mainstream, but how do we reach all these people that we don't yet um, know about? How do we find them? And that is, for me, very interesting. I have no answers. I'm very curious. I'm very interested in all the platforms, the social medias, and the... Um, you know, all the websites that the young people are going to that they all know about that we don't know about um, to really try and and find uh, a way to in- include um, these special uh, young artists that, that uh, I have to admit my ignorance is, I've met a lot of people because of equilibrium and because of word of mouth and so on, but I, I'm very curious and eager to meet more. I love, I love, I love these words because this is a, the second part of the road of roadmap. But first, let me thank um, Emmanuel for that sort of discussion. Uh, Emmanuel said something um, I love to 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 take um, uh, some some of your words and said now it's now. And I wanted to pay much one of you. It's 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 Anis because Anis told me a couple of months ago. It was not about his web seminar. He was telling me you should watch a young poetress. And he didn't know she was be she was the one who will be writing the hill we climb. And he was just recommending me to to watch Amanda Gorman. And and thank you so much. Um, and now so I've been so pleased to see Amanda coming to a kind of world reputation, and in a kind of very musical, I must say, performing action because it's 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 something like hip hop in some in some way. So um, we have 20, 20, 25 more minutes. So may I ask you maybe that kind of game, if, if you want. I, I took, I come back to uh, Yejim's uh, words very, very beginning. How do we better reflect the society? Um, I take maybe some of your colleagues' words, Stocks Dada now, head of, of the Arts Department at South Bank Center in London, who was telling me, uh, how can we, um, enable the, the right people to contribute to the classical music conversation. So if you had maybe, I don't know, two, one or two best practices, things you have been experiencing or things you have noticed, as Barbara was saying, how can we know where to find the new people we want to work with, we want to share? How can we do to better reflect the society we are living in for our practice? Which would be these one or these two best practices you would uh, recommend? So please now, I'm not giving the word to anyone. You just take it. May oh. I? Oh, sorry. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Go on, yes, please. Please. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay, for the for the best before uh, I tell you the be- best practice, of course, I wa- uh, I just t- took note of Emmanuel André. Emmanuel's words, if he said, if we move together, we win. I definitely agree with you because, you know, first of all, we have to raise awareness about gender inequality, inclusion, diversity in classical music. So for change uh, to happen, it has to happen in all levels and in all institutions, simply everywhere from education to orchestras, management, so we uh, all have to take a stand, otherwise uh, it's going to be very difficult. So uh, giving some best practices, of course, I want to uh, give this uh, the El Sistema. One of them is El Sistema, this uh, counter, uh, the same model in Turkey, Music for Peace Orchestra, where we worked uh, a lot with Anis for El Sistema uh, Europe together. So uh, this Music for Peace Foundation is a free education program for uh, school age children and uh, young people. And it is based in one of Istanbul's uh, most disadvantaged uh, neighborhoods. So the residents, they mostly come from 
uh, socially and economically underprivileged backgrounds. So this foundation works with children and young people aged um, between 7 to 20. And this program provides facilities, instruments, and teachers uh, for music uh, education. So it promotes the cultural uh, inclusion of disadvantaged young, uh, advantaged young people uh, in classical music. So uh, we have been one of the partner for uh, of Music for Peace uh, Foundation since 2014. And of course, uh, together with uh, El Sistema and Simon Bolivar uh, Symphony Orchestra when they came in 2011. So we took uh, uh, Jose Antonio Abreu to uh, Music for Peace Foundation, and that uh, this was this was the beginning of their relation. So this uh, this thing grew, and um, since 2014, uh, they are part of uh, Sistema Europe, and they uh, exchange uh, information. Uh, con they do concerts, master classes uh, in uh, different countries all together, they play together. And, uh, and since 2014, since six, seven years, they perform regularly at the, at the Istanbul Music Festival. They also organize master classes. So um, this, is, this is one of uh, uh, good uh, examples uh, of inclusion and uh, diversity. And another one, of course, um, is the what I can give from Turkey is the is about the empowerment uh, of uh, musicians, women musicians. Uh, so in in the in the festival, we have one uh, one program where we provide funding for the education of uh, young uh, women musicians, uh, students or uh, musicians at the very beginning of their career. It's only, uh, this, this funding is only for, uh, for women musicians. Uh, and of course, out of this, uh, from, uh, from UK, from the UK, uh, one of the best examples, I think my, uh, my colleagues would, would say a uh, Chineke orchestra is also a, a great example where I've been following uh, since some times. So yes, more inclusion. Is, so it's, it's also our responsibility, of course, uh, the festival programmers to think about it. Uh, I don't know who said this, but uh, invention is born out of necessity or something like this. I also say creation is, is born out of necessity. So uh, we also the pro, uh, think, think about programming and commission, commissioning new works to uh, women composers, composers of color, and uh, to give equal opportunity, more opportunity to, uh, to human conductors. So we really have to think about it. So far, uh, we, were, we were kind of lazy and slow, uh, but now I think uh, in the post-pandemic world, uh, we really have to recreate everything. I uh, recreate our way of thinking also about programming and about organizing everything. So true, so true. But greetings to Chichin Monoku, who was among us a couple of months ago and who is following our program very often. Libby, thank you, Redim. Libby. I mean, I just have a, a few quick things because obviously I agree with everything everybody says, but coming from the commercial agent side uh, where it's it's a tricky one for us in a way, not to feel sorry for us, obviously, but it is a tricky one for us because, you know, we do all, I think the importance is that we all work together. I think that's clear. But bluntly speaking, if I can be blunt, you might get this out before it goes online, but you know, if I speak to presenters internationally right now, and I talk about the artists that we work with currently, who we believe in, who we, some, we have a lot of young artists that we really 
think are special and that we want and believe that they should have a career. And we talk to presenters and we, we do what we do in the way that we do it. And then we're sort of always di directed to two questions. Do we have any female conductors and do we have any black artists? And quite directly, and that's a difficult one for, for us because as a commercial agency, we could make it our motivation to go out there and sign, you know, 10 female conductors, 10 black artists, and probably do great business for the next two to three years because we book further in advance. But that's not genuine and that's not the way that we are. And we have to, as you all said, it has to be from the groundworks up. It has to be partnership and it has to be sustainable. And that's very difficult sometimes in, in, in our world because it is competitive. And if there is a, you know, we are talking to some young artists, lots of young artists at the moment about possibly representing them, but with a view to building their career in the same way that we would do that with with white middle-class men, you know, in those things. We are still trying to do it in the same way because we could easily book, book someone for the next two years. It would be one of my easiest tasks to do. But in two years, where are they? If, they, if they're not ready to go to that orchestra because they don't have the experience, then, then their career will be over. And we talk about this in our company a lot because it is that balance of being a com competitive commercial agency and having some integrity and um, honesty and respect for the artists that we already look after who we have looked after for a long time some we've taken on in good faith you know who are now sometimes in some places at a disadvantage because they're white men I'm not suggesting we shouldn't be pushing women conductors and I'm not suggesting now is the time to act, but I think we all have to work together because we all have a responsibility for this to be the way of the world, not just, you know, a quick fix. I think um, and actually one of, sorry, just to say one of the projects that we've been really working on with one of our young American conductors, and hopefully we might get it off the ground next year, is a is a foundation or a festival or a summer academy which we're hopefully going to do in uh, upstate New York because we have a somebody that has a farm that wants to give back wants it to be a place for academy and that's very much about um, inclusion and I can send you there this it's Ryan McAdams our American conductor where he wants to work I think exactly as as you said George he wants to work with artists who bring their own voice and their own histories and their own backgrounds into um, our world for want of a better way of putting it. So it's not just about, you know, the, the old war horses, it's about bringing their voice and their culture into the academy. That's what I want to say. Thank we, you. Are, we have a very productive paradox and one of these we, we like to, to tackle. Vanessa, maybe George. Um, could I, yeah, I just want to bring in the idea of abundance and to think about growing our sector rather than shrinking it and taking resources away from one to give to another. Um, when we were running Key Change, we had some of the same arguments that you just raised, Libby, about, you know, well, what about all the people who were being programmed? And in in an ideal world, this is about making what we're presenting more relevant to more people and therefore growing the audience. So my hope is that by strengthening the programming of classical music, if we call it that, or whatever genre we're, we're working in, will ultimately um, generate more opportunities for more people rather than shrinking the whole, the whole industry. Because you know, the criticism that classical music will often face is elitism, um, racism in, in, in the United States, for example, sexism in, in every country. So I think by showing that we can include more people, it should benefit everyone. And that's, you know, believing in equity, equality, inclusion is, is something that's going to strengthen the sector. And I absolutely believe with many of the points you've made about moving together is the way that we can actually have progress and so 
That's why in the US at New Music USA, we're running an initiative called Amplifying Voices, which has brought together over 30 orchestras now. Um, each are working together in a, consor in, in a consortium to co-commission Black and Latinx composers across all generations from Tanya Leon to Shelley Washington, Jesse Montgomery, Tyshawn Sori, who's been incredibly popular over the past year. Um, and I think what's really important there, um, I think it was Yezim, you were talking about commissioning. I think co-commissioning is even more important because then one piece gets eight performances and, and gets to be heard by eight different audiences in different cities across the US. And I think one of the challenges we have with the canon of classical music and repertoire is that new music in general, but particularly new music by marginalized voices is not performed enough to ever give audiences a chance to become familiar with it. So I think that's another mechanism we need to kind of shift in our industry. And then I think also we probably need to reflect on, on how much orchestras, for example, are actually performing new music. So when you look at the statistics in the US, it's around about 16% of the repertoire is new. And that's another obstacle we have if we're, if we're talking about equity and inclusion. We're beginning to see many people revisiting pieces that have been written by black composers, by women who've now deceased, and, and that music is being um, presented and celebrated. That's happening in the UK as well. But I think having many more people around the artistic planning table so that we can shift the way programs are put together with the existing and new repertoire would be a really good good way of taking things to the next level. And, and just uh, to go back to language, I, I definitely would refer to all of this as positive action, not positive discrimination, because I think it is action that's gonna take us all forward to a place where we're all going to be more empowered. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe George, how can we help to build that new ecosystem, new media, new ways to promote these young artists, maybe, and not having a zero sum game in the end, as Libby was preventing us uh, um, to do, but trying to develop the market under quotation marks. Uh. Yeah, I was very impressed with what you said, Libby, because you were taking an invest, investment kind of model. In other words, the issue of any, anyone who wants to invest, for one thing, you're thinking about the future. Secondly, you're doing research, due diligence, who's out there. And the other thing is you're dealing with risk. There's no other way around that. So with that, I think at some point, you have to find people who are willing to undergo the risk along with you, you know, just, I mean, I'm not advising you on how to do what you do, but in fact, I don't know anything about that, but I'm just saying, I'm just noticing that people who take these risks, you know, one shouldn't have to take these risks all by yourself, particularly when, but on the other hand, particularly when the future of the field is at stake, because what happens is the same kinds of energies, uh, you know, you have diminishing returns after a while. It, it's like a kind of addiction, you know? I mean, it takes more and more of whatever you're addicted to to get you stoned. And then after a while, it doesn't work at all. And so, and then you're stuck. So you have to think about, the other last thing I wanted to say about this is people were talking about equity. And equity, you know, seems to mean in this conversation often equality of some kind. But I'm thinking about equity in terms of the investment, what you put into something, what you put, what you bring to the table. Oh, you know, oh, that's great. Whatever that is, that's fantastic. And what you bring to the table in order to be able to, um, and a lot of what's happening in a lot of uh, you know, the problems with a lot of non-diverse or la situations of lack where we don't see certain kinds of voices and it's always the same voices where, where they're missing, the same faces are missing and so on, is that the people who aren't missing are basically 
benefiting from unearned equity in the, in the, in the financial sense. So what we need to do is we need to start investing in new populations uh, really and to move beyond what looks more and more like a kinship model uh, where we see the same faces because we know them and, and so on. These other people, we don't know them as well. So that, you know, there's no small, in two seconds, we can't really prescribe anything. And so I'd be very interested in that screen that was just shared. Maybe that would help. <laughs> 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 it, but it was fascinating. I mean, it took, um, I'm not that specially there, but I think it took 150 years to the economy theory to get rid of Malthus and Ricardo and diminishing returns <laughs> up to Sean Peter and, uh, and, and Paul Romer in the 70s or 80s in Columbia University or Stanford, somewhere on the East or West Coast. So it took 150 years, I think. So, but we would try to, to be a little bit uh, quicker. Who, who would like to, to react to that program uh, or that kind of productive paradox if you were describing and Vanessa and George try to, to help with or solve? Barbara. Well, I'd just like to say one thing. Um, uh, I love the term positive action. I wrote that down, so I'm going to mm. use that from now on. Um, and uh, about what Libby said, I, it actually it resonated with me because <clears throat> as a as a conductor, um, I, I kind of, there's been a very strong um, movement to where are all the female conductors. Uh, and I started, I think just before that, so I was lucky the first couple of years that I was conducting, I didn't, I didn't have that all the time. And then all of a sudden, everything exploded around 2014. And some people said some really stupid things. And then everything was all about um, I, I, every interview I did seemed to be about gender. And I have to say, um, there were some orchestras that were asking me to come and perform with them and who I, with whom I didn't have a relationship. And it was very hard to figure out why I was being asked. And that's also the responsibility, of course, of the, the manager or agent to help figure that out. Um, but it's there were some instances where I could literally smell that I was being invited because of my gender, that they didn't, and, and it was tough because um, there was one particular orchestra that I went to where there seemed to have been a, a kind of policy to hire uh, so many female conductors from the management side of, of the orchestra, and the, the orchestra resented it. And I was put in a position uh, as the conductor, which was totally unexpected to me. I was naive. And I walked out there and met with these faces of hostility <laughs> and couldn't figure out what was going on. I haven't even given my first downbeat yet. And it, it was literally because they, they had not been included in this action by their management to hire, uh, a, let's say, a quotient of female conductors. And I suffered enormously from it. And it wasn't just about, I mean, it was interesting what you said, Libby, about you know, what will happen to them in two years. But it, it had a very strong psychological effect on me. Um, it was very damaging um, to meet with that hostility that wasn't personal, but of course it felt like that when you had to be up there for several hours a day for a week. And um, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I am very sympathetic to it, and I, I would hate for any, any of my colleagues, male or female, or to be put in a position where they, they are not welcome. And it's a, a strange thing because who is doing the welcoming? Who is, who is engaging the, the, um, like the conductor or the soloist or whoever. And I think it's a very important thing to consider for the overall well-being of, of the artist. Um, I don't think I was not good enough to be on the podium, but I was suffering from a reaction that didn't have to do with my quality. It really, really was all about my gender. And so that was, that's maybe an important, I just wanted to add that 
to no, it's... Can I ask something about that? Yeah, please, please. What, I mean, assuming that, I mean, couldn't you assume that all these women were really good? I mean, like, what was the objection? Just that there were too many or that somehow one should only have a certain number or, or what was it? I mean, if they went and decided, I don't know. I mean, I've been in academic situations where I've said, well, look, the fastest way for us to get change in our graduate student cohort is to admit only women for the next four years. And uh, some people said, well, what about quality? And I said, well, I don't think we're going to have a problem with quality, but we, at least not in terms of the quality of the people we're admitting. And this is Columbia University. We have a lot of choice. So, but we do have a quality with the current program because of the lack of women. So if we're going to fix it, we're gonna to have to take strong action. So I, what I'm hearing from this experience of yours, Barbara, is that people objected to the strong action and they weren't able to see the fact that they were getting, hearing some, some really good young people. And you know, that's hard, if that's the case, if I'm reading that correctly, you know, it's a real problem because um, you know, it's hard to avoid the possibility that you are, or the women, or that the focus on women is, is being blamed for a situation that in large measure was caused by, uh, you know, in a way, deliberate absences. And, you know, it's, it's very ugly. But as you said, including people, everyone, instead of a top-down decision, was probably just as much of a problem. Yeah. Because it just can't be, I mean, there are all these people, I'm sure they were great. So. Yeah, I, I don't know the, I'm sure that in general, the level that had been brought in was good um, of, of female conductors. And I didn't actually do a lot of research on it. All I knew was the hostility that I was meeting. I was told by a few key members um, I mean, at one point I, because the orchestra was misbehaving so badly, and at one point I turned to the concertmaster and I said, is it always like this? And the concertmaster looked at me and said, only with the women. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> you can imagine, with someone like me, I, I normally, I would be able to laugh it off, but it was wow. just, it was poison. Uh, so. I, I am, I am. I'm very happy to have said to all of you before that interview and pen discussion that we usually conclude with a very positive note <laughs> because this time it is also full of hope. And I would say my personal opinion is that this problem with the policy of inclusion of um, you and the problem it may have uh, um, um, uh, weakened has also a lot to do with inclusion maybe of that symphonic body within its own society they should also look for this, how they were included into their own environment, because probably also they should, uh, um, you know, uh, problematize this and ask themselves what they do for being also an inclusive force within their own society. I think the, the circles are big and uh, we should always look for the outer one if we want to behave um, correctly or at least in a, some positive way for the, the future. Um, there would have been many, many more, I think, examples and user cases and experiences to report. Uh, I hope, um, I'm sure we haven't been exhaustive, but I hope we have been enlightening for all of you. I would love to thank you again personally for your participation. Uh, and thank Francoise and the Centre National de la Musique in, in Paris for hosting us. And I give back the word to Paris and and Francois, thank you so much again. Thank you very much for uh, to all of you for sharing all these thoughts and input. That's really fascinating. And we really hope that sharing all these very crucial subjects um, is going to open minds and help breaking all the walls around classical music. That's very important. And that's every single one's responsibility. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, for your faithfulness. And we will share all this content uh, very soon. And uh, see you soon again. Thank you. Bye.